Welcome everyone. This is the first webinar for the new year. The topic is book banning and curricula censorship in California, AEW California to the rescue. Our key presenter is Kathy Harper. She's a member of AAUW California Public Policy Committee. She is also the chair of the School Board Project Subcommittee. As you can see, there are other speakers joining her, and Kathy will introduce each one when it's their turn to present. Kathy, I turn the meeting over to you. Thank you so much, Julika. And the very first order of my business is to thank uh, Julika, Dawn, and Randa, the communications team, for facilitating this and making it possible for us to present to all of our members. So with that, I want to say good evening and thank you all so much for coming out tonight and for your interest in this really important topic. We know that our membership is uh, concerned, as concerned about this as we are. We heard you when you weighed in, uh, excuse me, back in November when we were updating the public policy priorities and this was on a lot of our members' minds. So um, as you know, I'm Kathy Harper. You most of you should know me by now uh, from prior presentations. Uh, I have been the AUW California Public Policy Director for the last five years. I'm termed off of the board now, but I've, I'm remaining uh, a part of the Public Policy Committee. And as Julika said, I'm the chair of the committee overseeing this project, which we are calling the School Board Project. I'm a retired prosecutor and an adjunct professor of law with many years of uh, public, many years of experience in the public policy arena. My other two presenters you see here are Sina Trigas and Jean Slater Burns, who are both AUW members. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about them when we come to their half of the presentation. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So here's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. First, we'll define the issue and provide you with an overview of the challenges that we're facing as a nation uh, in this arena. Next, we'll bring you up to date on what's happening in California and what the AEW California Board and specifically the public policy team is doing about it. Finally, we'll talk about how you all can get involved, which is what you're really here for tonight. We're going to end with several action items for you. The first one will be supporting candidates for school board races, and my portion will conclude with answering the question on everybody's mind. Can we really do that? The second action item is, we want you to be a voice for our message at school board meetings. This is where Sina and Jean will take over, and Sina will help you understand the role of school boards and share a proposed script with you if you choose to uh, participate at that level. And Jean will provide you with, the, with tips on how to make your experience professional and stress-free. Next slide, please. So I think a little humor is always a great way to start a serious conversation. And I particularly like this cartoon for two reasons. One, it perfectly encapsulates the first prong of our three-prong issue. And I'll get into the rest, the other prongs in a minute but it encapsulates the first one, which is, which is book banning. And then the sub, the sub message that entering a bookstore may provoke your thoughts is exactly the message to all of you. Warning, over the next 60 minutes, pre prepare to have your thoughts provoked. Next slide, please. So let's start off with a look at the scope of the problem. As I said, our public schools are facing a three-pronged attack, not just about book banning. These headlines sum them up nicely. First, we have a renewed effort to ban certain books in our schools. Here we see that 350, the more than 350 just in the state of Florida uh, were banned in 20, uh, from 2022 to 2023, but there are so many more across the nation. Next, we are seeing school boards and government offices attempting to censor curriculum around certain topics, such as we see here in Texas, where the governor says schools no longer have to teach about women's suffrage. Do we have any doubt that this is an AUW topic? So we don't have no longer have to teach about women's suffrage or the civil rights movement. And finally, we're seeing school boards adopting gender, gender identity policies that deprive our LGBTQ plus students of a safe and welcoming learning environment. 
This last one also confirms that these issues aren't occurring in just a couple of states like Florida and Texas, but, uh, but across the nation, as we'll also see in the next slide, which can come now. Thank you. So here's a, a little snapshot of what's going on across the US just on this issue of book banning. From June through December of 2022, 21 states representing 66 different school districts have instituted book banning, which includes 1,447 books among them all. That's 874 unique titles. And um, the cartoon provides a succinct message as well. Banning books for any reasons is a really dumb idea. Next slide, please. So how did this all get started? Book banning and censorship are not new phenomena for sure. We all know that. How Some of you may remember Tipper Gore in, uh, in the 80s and her efforts to label music albums she and her group found inappropriate for young, for young ears. But what is new and what is particularly dangerous at this time is that current efforts are targeting our public schools and our, and our youth. Students are being prohibited from reading certain books, learning historically accurate information, and participating in certain activities, with the primary goal being to infiltrate school boards across the nation and install members who support these odious policies. So I'm wondering how many of you have heard of this group, Moms for Liberty? They're not the only ones, but they're a group that we're going to focus on uh, a little bit of attention on tonight for several reasons that you'll see. Um, they began, Moms for Liberty began in Florida, where else, as a grassroots movement during COVID to protest school shutdowns and mask mandates. After that all started dying down in 2022, they looked at this fairly massive movement that they had built up and started looking for new causes to unleash it on. Question is, just how powerful are they? Next slide, please. Here's an article that helps us understand that and answers that question. The article says that since the group's founding in Florida in 2020, I'm going to now come down to where I've highlighted here in yellow, it has helped install 275 of its favored candidates on school boards just in 2022 alone. And there's something else significant in the article that I wanna point out to you. That's a, going back to the first line since their founding, its influence over local and national Republican politics has grown exponentially. So I'm gonna interject something important here. You will hear me in this slide and in, in, in other slides, um, talk about this movement being associated with the Republican Party and also with some elements on the extreme Christian right. Let me state unequivocally, I am not being partisan in raising this and I am not against Christians in any way, but what I am in favor of are facts. And the facts are demonstrating conclusively that the Republican Party is putting a lot of money and political power behind these groups and their efforts as are some influential pastors in many of our communities. Next slide, please. To further demonstrate this, here on the left, we see that one of the co-founders of Moms for Liberty is, has been entrenched in the Florida government. And on the right, this is a snapshot of six different Republican candidates who, have, uh, who are appearing here at CPAC, the, um, um, uh, Oh, a conservative political action committee. Sorry, for blank for a second. Um, and each one of them, in their turn, are asking for uh, an endorsement by by the Moms of Liberty. So that's kind of what's going on across the nation. But what about right here in True Blue, California? It could never happen here, right? Next slide, please. Well, once again, the headlines tell the story. Over here on the left, we see, on my left, we see in, in Glendale, in Los Angeles County, groups are fighting each other to the point where the police have to be called in. What are they fighting over? A high school wanted to acknowledge Pride Month on campus, and this is what resulted. 
down in um, Riverside County, over here on the right, Temecula School Board meeting erupts in chaos, forcing law enforcement again to step in. What are they fighting about in Temecula? They were battling over the inclusion of a reference to Harvey Milk, the first openly gay member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in a social studies textbook. This effort was led by a pastor of the local mega church there in Temecula. In Chino, which was also spearheaded by a local pastor, in Corona and Orange and Rockland, school board members are adopting policies to restrict certain activities of transgender students. It is here, my friends, it is here. Next slide, please. And they are literally here right in my backyard. Excuse me. I just moved to Cambria recently up on the Central Coast. And I'm part of San Luis Obispo County. And I wake up one morning to this headline. Moms for Liberty start their first California chapter in San Luis Obispo County. The important thing here is that the group is looking for more interested local moms to start subcommittees, attend school board meetings, meet with meet and meet with with uh, board members. So, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm looking at something different. Um, okay. So they're here and they're on the move and they're working it. So um, next slide, please. And some of our Republican government officials are just as involved as those in Texas and Florida. Here's an article in the LA Times talking about the efforts of Republican Assemblyman Essayli, E-S-S-A-Y-L-I, I think it's on here, yeah, um, stating basically that since we Republican legislators can't get anywhere in the assembly, we are taking, or in the legislature, we are taking the fight to the school boards. That was his direct quote, that we are shifting focus to shape school boards up and down the state. He's introduced a bill to require schools to alert parents if a child identifies differently from what is was on their birth certificate. It failed, but he has pressed the cause with school boards in Chino and Marietta, and is working closely with groups like Moms for Liberty who, who oppose legislation, even just simple things like making it a misdemeanor to harass a school official or to allow districts to do training on cultural competency. Meanwhile, fortunately, other government officials are fighting back. Next slide, please. So in... Um, on, in, on June 1st of 2023, Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, and State Superintendent of Schools, Tony Thurman, issued a joint statement uh, setting forth California policy on these topics. And these are the three highlights that came from their joint statement. It's, it's really long. And you can read it. It's on the, uh, on the website. And I've, I've given you a link in the references in the back of the, at the end of this presentation. You can read the entire um, statement if you want. These are the three highlights. Number one, the Constitution restricts the removal of books from libraries and curricula. It's against the First Amendment. Second, education and exposure to various worldviews are vital for our youth. And of course, AUW agrees with that. And third, the California Education Code requires local educational agencies to provide a representative and unbiased curriculum uh, curriculum and protects a student's right to freedom of speech. Next slide, please. And it appears highly likely that we're about to get a law that encompasses these policies. A, uh, Assembly Bill 1078 uh, was introduced a couple of months ago and it has already passed both houses of the legislature, the Assembly and Senate, and it is sitting on the governor's desk as of this moment. I don't believe he signed it yet, but we have every reason to believe that he's going to since he was instrumental in writing it. So uh, what is AB 1078 about? Three things that you need to know. It would require the Department of Education to assess whether the local educational agency has complied with state laws requiring public schools to provide pupils with comprehensive, culturally competent, and accurate instruction about the history, 
experiences and viewpoints of people from different communities in California. Second, it would require the Department of Education by July 1st of 2025 to develop guidance and public educational materials to ensure that all Californians can access information about educational law and policies that safeguard the right to an accurate and inclusive curriculum. And finally, and I think this might be the most important part is that it actually provides sanctions. It would reduce a school district's local control funding formula allocation by a specified amount if the superintendent determines the school district has not provided sufficient textbooks or instructional materials pursuant to these provisions. And I want to add that AUW, a public policy uh, committee, has voted to endorse and uh, to support AB 1078. Next slide, please. So now it's our turn. This is the part where we say in our in our title, AUW California to the rescue, we are not going to sit idly by while this is going on. What are we doing? We are we have formed the school board project. This is a, a subcommittee of the public policy committee. The board has authorized its formation. Um, while all of this was going on, I'll give you a little history on how we came to be. Uh, while all this was going on, we were approached by an organization called Equality California. Uh, Equality California is an LGBTQ plus advocacy group that has previously focused uh, pretty much primarily on legislation affecting LGB LGBTQ uh, students. But they were as alarmed as we were about what was happening with California school boards, and they decided to launch a campaign to recruit, train, and fund candidates who oppose these measures. They asked AUW California, they approached us, they actually were instrumental in bringing us into this. We wanted to do something, but we just kind of really kind of didn't know what, where, where, our, where our resources would be best used utilized. So that's about the time that they approached us and asked if we wanted to work with them. They thought we would be good partners. We agreed it was a good fit and formed the uh, school board project as a subcommittee. And um, the the board, ta once the board agreed, the, they tasked us with these four items. They wanted us to assess the extent of the issue in California. Was it really a big deal here? Uh, assess the extent of our membership concern over the issue. Is this something that our membership thought that we should be engaged in? Assess the extent of our membership's willingness to participate. If we launched this and we uh, had any hopes of success, we knew that we would need to have as many of our members on board as possible. And then once the assessment was completed, then the final step was to provide the public policy committee and the state board with recommended courses of action. We immediately put together, once we got the go-ahead, we put together our committee. I'm the chair. Um, I'm a member of the online branch. We have Sue Miller from, Ro from Roseville, who's a member of the South Placer uh, branch. We have Lorinda Ochoa, who's a member of the Danville Alama Walnut Creek branch. We have Sina Trigas, who is the president of the Carlsbad Oceanside Vista branch and a member of Fallbrook, the Fallbrook branch and Ashley Dargert, who is a member of the San Jose branch. So you can see we, we have pretty good representation uh, up and down the state. Um, so our first step was to put out a survey to our membership to fulfill these first these assessment tasks. We wanted to see what uh, how you all weighed in. So next slide, please. So here's what we found. This is a little snapshot of the results of that survey that we put out in May. We uh, got 83 of our members uh, weighed in. Of those, they represented 65 branches. We had some duplicates, uh, different members from uh, the same branch might have responded. So we had 65 branches represented. That's over 50%. That's a really good turnout. We were really impressed with that. And they, those 65 branches represented 95 distinct school districts throughout the state. We wanted to know, um, do you think this is a current issue in your districts? And uh, of the 65, 24 said that they felt that it was. Uh, 18 said definitely they were aware of it uh, being an issue or and another six said it might be. They were, just weren't sure. 
We asked, do you think this might be an issue in the future? Do you have some reason to believe that it's coming to your district? Or do you live in a district where you think this kind of thing might take hold? 37 of our respondents uh, said yes to that. 11, definitely yes, and 26, maybe. And then we asked, um, do, uh, would, would you be willing to be involved in a project to do something about this? Are you willing to help out in some way? And this was a great response. Almost all of our respondents said yes, they wanted to help. 27 said definitely. 33 said maybe. And of course, we hope after this presentation that we can turn those 33 maybes into definite yeses along with all the rest of you on here. So I'm not going to go over the three, the final three columns at this time. I'll come back to that, but go ahead and uh, give me the next slide if you would. So based on this um, response, we felt that uh, this was definitely something our members wanted us to be doing and they wanted to be doing it with us. So we decided to move forward with the project. We assigned each of our committee members, you don't see my name up here because I'm busy doing other things, but the other four committee members, um, we assigned them to act as a liaison to certain branches. So the, the branches that we were immediately concerned with are those who answered yes on the survey that they thought this was a current issue or might is, was likely to become one in the near future. We felt there was more urgency there. So uh, we started with those branches and we grouped them into uh, by their districts. I've got up here IBC slash district. I know you're not all in an IBC. So if you're, these either represent your IBC or a district that your branch might be located in. So you can see who your liaison is. And I just want to interject here. Don't sweat it. This is going to be available to you. Um, I'll just let you know now our committee has put together a school board project toolkit that has already been posted to the website. Uh, it's a, it's a, under public policy um, toolkits. So, and, and, and then down at the bottom of the menu will be school board projects. So you'll find it there. And this document, your uh, liaison, uh, list of liaisons and all the documents that we'll be referring to throughout this presentation will be uh, part of that toolkit will be available to you. Um, okay. Um, Next slide, please. All right, and then again, pursuant to the results that we got from the, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to say one other thing about the liaisons. So they have already contacted, you don't have to go back to the slide, but just, but they have already contacted the branches that have currently waited on the survey. Um, and if you, after this presentation, if you decide that you want to become involved, we invite you to take the survey. You'll be getting the link for that. Um, and if, as as branches are added, your uh, liaison will be contacting you. They'll, we, we check that every week. And then as soon as they discover that there are new uh, branches within their assigned IBC or district, um, they will be contacting you. And the purpose of that is mostly to see how can we help you? What can we do for you? And as well as how you can help us giving us information. Okay, so based on the results of the survey, we came up with the fourth task, our recommended courses of action. So um, this involves several things. The first one is that, oops, um, ask your board to endorse the candidate actually is was repeated down under number four. It's not It's not a separate category, it's part of number four. But the, the first one actually I wanna talk about is we want to encourage our members to identify potential candidates in their districts and to submit their names to their assigned liaison. So there's um, there's three three basic things that, we're, that the, the school board project consists of. And it all has to do, they all boil down to we want school boards that represent our values of diversity and inclusion. And we want to fight against this influx of power and money that's going to candidates who, who are more regressive and want to, to do just the opposite. So all of our uh, um, recommended uh, courses of action are built around that final goal. So we wanna achieve that in the following ways. So number one is we wanna encourage all of you to identify potential candidates in your district. And we're looking for candidates who share our values and who are qualified, of course, that's the most important thing. We wanna make sure that they are qualified to make educational decisions about our youth. So we want candidates who have some sort of uh, educational background. 
Um, and then we're asking you, once you have done that, uh, we're asking you to submit their names to an assigned liaison. We have also, as part of the toolkit, we have developed a script, a little sample script. If you're nervous about, you know, how do we approach a, a candidate? Um, what do we say? We've developed a, a sample script under three different scenarios, and you'll find that as part of the toolkit. So that should help you. Uh, there's lots of ways to, to find and identify candidates. Uh, one of the most important ones is going to um, going to school board meetings, listening to who's there, who's speaking, uh, who what even members of the audience who get up and speak with authority and um, and seem to know what they're really talking about and seem energized by the topic. That might be someone to approach afterwards. Um, talk to current school board members that you might know. See if they have any referrals. Talk to um, friends of yours who are in other civic or social justice oriented kinds of organizations and ask them if they have any good candidates. So once you've identified someone who have, you've spoken to and they've said, yeah, I might be interested in that, um, we're asking you to submit that to your assigned liaison or put it in the survey. Um, and then the school board project member from the committee will submit that name to uh, an appropriate coalition member for hopefully, I should have put that in there, hopefully financial and training support. Um, here's kind of what happened in a nutshell. Equality, we were going to partner with Equality California. The partnership consisted of us finding them candidates and then them taking our candidates and uh, providing them with training and financial support. We have very, very recently found out that actually they are only going to be supporting candidates who, have, who themselves identify as LGBTQ+. So we may not always know that, of course, we're certainly not asking you to go out there and ask potential candidates for that information. But if you happen to know uh, that a candidate has self-identified as LGBTQ, then we would, um, we would definitely pass that information on to um, Equality California, and they will continue to work with us in terms of providing financial support and training. But that learning that caused us to kind of start looking around to see if there were other uh, organizations that we could partner with. And we've learned that there are a lot of organizations out there who are doing this work. There's a list of them at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, yes, the uh, a question just popped up about who were one of the members that we're um, coalitioning with, and we are. Um, sorry, it went off really fast, so I don't, I don't remember exactly the name of it. But um, anyway, that list is in, in your uh, references and resources. And um, if any of you have any other names of potential coalition members, please pass those on to your liaison. We're, we're right in the process of trying to gather that information that what we're really looking for. There's all kinds of training materials that are available to a first time candidate. So I'm not so as worried about the training issue, but we would like to find an organization that could help with uh, finance their campaigns. But right now we're not promising anybody that. We're just uh, we're just telling them that we'll we'll pass their their name on to um, uh, an organization that might be able to provide some support for them. All right. So once a candidate has been referred and they're accepted for the project and they have officially declared their candidacy, um, then we would. Uh, ask all of you, I uh, want to encourage all of our members to support their campaigns in a number of ways. Here's a number of ways we're giving you that you can do that. First is ask your board to endorse the candidate. And again, you're probably all right now kind of nervous, like, oh, can we really do that? And I thought we didn't endorse candidates. So hold your britches. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, a number of ways you can help introduce your candidate to the community, such as hosting a meet and greet at your house. Uh, distributing flyers, um, it, helping us with a social media media blitz. Now that's going to, that's in the process of being developed. We're going to be working on that over the winter and hopefully have our social media materials ready to go by spring. And um, we'll be that'll be part that'll eventually be made part of the toolkit and be available to all of you. And a number of ways that you can volunteer to work on a candidate's campaign. And then the final way is uh, the final course of action that we developed was to encourage our members, all of you, to attend and speak out at school board meetings. Some of you are going to be nervous about this. 
Um, it's not maybe not your thing, but if you don't aren't going to feel comfortable speaking out, we ask you to at least attend and kind of be our eyes and ears in your communities and report back to us what's happening in your districts. But we really hope that you'd be willing to stand up and speak out and deliver our message. And Sina and Jean are going to be really, really helpful in their portion of this presentation in making you feel more comfortable in doing that. Um, all right, next slide, please. So now that you know what we're doing, I'm going to wrap up my portion um, by telling you why we're doing it and under what authority we're doing it. So, Julika, can you go back? I think we should be on slide 20 now, not 21. Yeah. So thank you. So why are we involved? Is this really something that AEW wants to take on? What's our, how do we, how do we fit in all of this? Well, the first thing I want you to be aware of is that research has shown that approximately 41% of banned books feature LGBTQ themes, main characters, or significant supporting characters. And characters of color make up 40% of the main or significant secondary characters while 21% of the titles deal with racial and racist topics. This is no coincidence that these are the materials that are the subject of this, uh, uh, of this attack, of this onslaught. And these are things we care about, right? Here's a, an excerpt I pulled from the introduction to our AUW public policy priorities. This is at the national level. AUW believes that high quality public education is the foundation of a democratic society and the key to improving economic prosperity and gender equality. We support academic freedom, civic education, protection from censorship and bias free education. And further here in, in California from the AUW California public policy priorities. The AUW California Public Policy Program establishes policy directives that are consistent with our values of achieving fair and equitable opportunities for our diverse society, including students' access to diverse staff and curriculum that represents historically accurate information. Next slide, please. All right, so now, what is our authority? Can we really do this? My answer is yes, we can, and I'm going to tell you where I get that from. So again, referring to AEW National, the Policies and Procedures Manual, Section 301, addresses candidates for public office. Section 2, Subsection 2 specifically uh, addresses the endorsement of candidates for nonpartisan elective office, which most school board races are. And it tells us uh, under A that a nonpartisan elective office is an office for which party affiliation does not appear on the ballot next to the candidate's name. And B, that AUW affiliates with 501c4 status, which is the majority of all of you of affiliates, all branches are affiliates, may recruit and or endorse candidates for nonpartisan elective offices. So there you go. But. That's not the end of it. Next slide, please. There are a couple of caveats. And the first one is that if you're a 501c3 and not a c4, some of our branches we know have organized and incorporated as their own 501c3. So if your branch has done that, you may not recruit or endorse for any kind of elected office, even if it's nonpartisan. But don't leave us because there are other ways that you can still be involved without having your branch uh, endorse a candidate if you're a 501c3. The second caveat is this, the, that the, uh, Section 301 says that before endorsing candidates for nonpartisan elective office, AUW state affiliate organizations must carefully investigate state and local election laws and where a state or local election law considers endorsement itself a contribution, AUW state affiliate organizations may not endorse whether it's partisan or nonpartisan. So as you might have guessed, I have carefully investigated our state laws and this is what uh, it says. The, the regulations come under the Fair Political Practices Commission. That's what FPPC stands for. And regulation 18215 subsection A states that a contribution is any payment made for political purposes for which a donor does not 
receive full and adequate consideration. So we're not talking about payments here. Nobody's paying us for an endorsement. If they do, run away fast. Nobody is, we're not paying for endorsement. They're not asking for endorsements. We're not paying for endorsements. But more importantly, this section goes on to list about 25 or 30 kinds of activity that do constitute a contribution. And a contribution and endorsement is not in within that list. It's nowhere in any of the FPPC regulations does it state that in California, endorsement is considered a contribution. So I think it's safe to say that we have satisfied uh, this, this uh, request or this requirement of AUW National. Uh, next slide, please. All right, final couple of mentions in the uh, policies uh, in the uh, policies and procedures from AUW. Also within uh, section 301 and subsection four addresses other kinds of contributions by an affiliate. It states first that the AUW affiliates may not contribute money, that no donations, you cannot, uh, your branch cannot make a, a, a monetary donation to your preferred candidate. You cannot give them mailing lists. They might ask for that because of course that helps them, it gives them a whole bunch of potential voters that they think they can reach. You cannot give them your branch mailing list or any mailing list affiliated with AEW or AEW California or anything of material value. So that's the first one. The second one is a little more important because I have in the prior slide, I have asked all of you to get involved in the, your preferred candidates campaign. I've given you some things that you can do. Here's another little caveat, however. Most of these things you cannot do, this is an AUW rule, you cannot do collectively as an, a, as an official AUW affiliate sponsored activity. So for instance, if your candidate was hosting a rally um, for, on behalf of their candidacy, you cannot, your branch cannot go and set up a table and at that table uh, uh, display your AEW banner and have, pass out flyers or other campaign material on behalf of your candidate. That would be a, a an affiliate sponsored activity. AUW says that's a no-no. But you can still do every single one of those activities that I outlined as an individual on your own, even though you're in a we're asking you as an AUW member because we know you share our values. We're asking you to do it, but you just cannot do it as a group branch activity. And here's the final one, AUW affiliates may not publish paid or unpaid partisan political announcements or advertisements. So again, since this is a nonpartisan, these are nonpartisan uh, uh, elections, you may then publish announcements and advertisements in your affiliate publication. So that means once your branch has decided to uh, endorse a candidate, you can uh, put that endorsement in your newsletter, you can post it on your website as well. And FPPC provides specifically that uncompens uncompensated messages on social media are not considered contributions. So that would be perfectly permissible. All right, my final slide, I'm gonna wrap up here. If you go to the last slide for me, thank you. I have one final ask of you, please send information on any and all of these activities that you decide to get involved with to your assigned liaison. These include, if you have contact with a potential candidate and what the outcome of that is, did they, did they agree? If they didn't agree, don't, you don't have to worry, but mostly what we're concerned with is um, if you have someone that you've talked to and they said, yes, they're interested, they might say, I'm not committing, but I'd like more information. They may say, yeah, I really want to do that. How do I do it? Um, Send that information to your liaison. Give them their name, the candidate's phone number, and email, two both ways to, to connect, and then um, a brief summary of their qualifications. So these are things, of course, when you approach the candidate, the potential candidate, you're going to have to get this information from them, uh, what their qualifications, what their background is in education is what we're really looking for. And then if you decide to engage in any of the campaign support activities that I've outlined, please uh, let us know about that, what you're doing. And then um, if you decide to attend a school board meeting, let us know just if you attended, even if you didn't speak, please let us know that you attended. If you did speak, let us know that. And then Jean is going to, has uh, in her work with the League of Women Voters, they have launched a, a project that involves 
kind of um, analyzing what's going on, keeping track of what's going on at school board meetings, and they put together a checklist. And she's going to go over that with you. And we're going to ask you to take that checklist with you to your school board meetings, fill it out, and send it to your uh, assigned liaison. And finally, if you haven't taken the survey yet, please do. And phew, I'm done. That's a lot of information, I know. We're gonna open it up now for questions. And as Julika said, please keep your questions to just this section of what I have already asked because likely anything else is gonna be covered in the next section. So do we have questions? Oh, okay, well, let me, uh, this is Dawn Johnson speaking and let me bring forward a few questions that have popped through. First of all, I wanna mention that several people have suggested some organizations that you might consider partnering with, or they're wondering if you've been reaching out to some of these organizations that are doing some of the same work. And so uh, what we have done is suggested that they submit that information to the liaison that you've identified for them so that you guys can run with that. And failing that, I've suggested they might want to give that information to you about suggested organizations. One organization though that's been asked, that's you know a large one that we you might want to address is, have you been working with the California School Boards Association? We have, uh, I have contacted them and I have not heard back from them. So I can't say we're working with them, but they are definitely on our radar as is the California Teachers Association. Okay, um, great. Um, a couple of questions have come in. I want to, the first one I like relates to AB 1078. And uh, I'm going to read this directly rather than paraphrasing to make sure that it is a correctly phrased question. Does that third specification of AB 1078 introduce incentives that punish the victims, slicing LCFF funds from those kids who need it while their school boards are victimizing them for political grandstanding? It's a um, question. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I understand the question is that will, if by slashing funds, will students in the long run be um, be jeopardized or, or, or penalized by having fewer funding funds available? Uh, I think that's a really good question. And I have to be honest, I have not, um, I haven't looked at it from that standpoint, but um, I, I think it's a viable question. And somebody from either I or somebody from public policy team will take a look at that, a closer look at that and uh, get back to you. I think that's all we can do right now. Cause I don't have, I don't have 1078 in front of me. Okay. Um we're asking, uh, what if the branch is organized as a 501c3? Are you encouraging branches to be organized as a 501c4 or both? Well, if you, I can't say that, uh, you know, as a general rule that you should change your your um, nature of your incorporation. But if you want to, if you want as a branch to get involved in this, you cannot do it as a branch, as a 501c3. So that would be a decision that your branch would have to make is how important is it to you to do this work versus whatever the reason was that caused you to incorporate as a 501c3 in the in the first place. Uh, that's really gonna have to be a branch decision. Okay, we have, um, well, the, let me scroll back here. Um, while school board positions are nonpartisan, many candidates do seek endorsement from a political party. Will we be able to endorse a candidate that does receive such an endorsement? We can, but we will not work with that organization. For instance, some of these uh, candidates will be likely endorsed by, uh, if, if not the Democratic, not the state Democratic Party, but by maybe local city Democratic parties. Um, we would not get involved with that, uh, you know, at that level. Like, I, I wouldn't suggest that you go to a Democratic Party meeting to try to find candidates. We we kind of it's a fine line, and we have to be careful. So we have to rely on our members' good sense and good judgment and discretion, um, keeping in mind that we don't want, um, you know, we, we we don't want this to be seen as a partisan because we are we're only involved at all because it's nonpartisan. So, um, you know, if you're if you have a situation that comes up and you're not sure about it, just send me uh, an email and um, I'll parse it and I'll uh, we'll, I'll look at it and our, our public policy chairs will look at it and uh, we'll let you know if we think it's something that crosses the line. 
Okay, thanks, Kathy. A couple more questions regarding 501c3 status and what's allowed. Um, if we are a 501c3, we could still hold educational activities such as candidate forums, ask questions about candidates' positions on books, et cetera. Is that correct? Is that's exactly correct? Yeah, you just the main things you can't. You, there are three things, two two primary things you can't. You can't recruit or endorse candidates, and you can't. Well, none of us can do any campaign activities as a um, as a branch. Those are the no nos. Okay. And while we may not be able to represent a particular branch, may we show up at school board meetings proudly wearing AAUW California t-shirts? Absolutely, because that's not that that's not a, connected to a specific candidate. As long as you don't stand up there and say, I'm, you know, I'm here to endorse it or you know, speak on behalf of this candidate. Um, absolutely, we would encourage you to uh, that. That's one of the another added benefit of this project is that it gives us an opportunity to get our name out there and to let the community know and the public know that this is an AUW uh, concern. So by all means, the the tenants of school board meetings, as long as you keep the candidate's name out of it, you can uh, do whatever you want as a branch. And just one more on that on that general topic. If a branch goes through the entire endorsement procedures properly, may we then host a meet and greet for the endorsed candidate with voluntary food donations, et cetera, not using branch funds? I would be wary of using your meet and greet to solicit um, donations yourself. If the candidate wants to do that separate from you, uh, being involved in it, um, I think that's that's getting too close to the line. I would suggest that you not get involved in soliciting donations. My what I'm really encouraging you to do is give them a forum where they you know, the community can meet them and they can get their their name out there. Right. Thank you. Uh, slightly different topic. About two more if we have time. Twice you referenced that candidates should have a background in education. Can you explain what you mean by this and why you have have you articulated this as important? The reason, I'll take the second one first. The reason that we've articulated this is that when we talk about, we, we wanna solicit qualified candidates, it's not enough just that they share our values. That's what our focus on, is on, of course. But we want um, we want school board members who know about education and who are qualified to make educational decisions uh, on a number of topics. This, these aren't the only kinds of issues that they're going to be confronted with. And we want to make sure that we have qualified people in uh, on our school boards who can deal with a whole host of issues that confront our youth. And so members of uh, I'm sorry, candidates who have been educators themselves, if they've been teachers or if they've been in, in, in administration at some level um, and share our values, uh, that's the best candidate that, that we could hope for. So um, again, we don't want someone who just, um, who has no, no background at all in education just because they share our values. Uh, we wanna make sure that they're qualified and know what they're doing. Thank you. Great, great answers as always, Kathy. One more just broad question and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, someone has asked, what would it take for us to start our own school board project to train candidates? Um, I don't see any reason that you can't do that. When you ask me what it would take, it would take um, a commitment and willingness. <laughs> you can use any of our materials, but but most importantly, you have to know what you're doing. So you have to uh, you know make sure that you have studied the materials. As I said, there's a lot of training materials available. Um, there's a, a great uh, organization that I have listed on the references. It's uh, SJC. Social Justice uh, uh, Conference, I think is the, what the C is. And they have a fabulous, on their website, they have a fabulous training uh, module. And it's, it goes all the way from, you know, how to get your campaign started, all the rules, all the deadlines. Um, I mean, that's really what all you'd have to do is point the, the your candidate in, the, in that direction and they can pretty much train themselves. Uh, the training that Equality California was going to provide was very formal. It was actually classes that they, it's through a, a group called Victory Fund. And uh, Victory Fund is set up to do these trainings all over California. And so, again, if you have an LGBT, a known LGBTQ client, uh, candidate, they, they, they'll, they can, we can refer them for Victory Fund training. But if you want to do it yourself, um, you know, there's, there's resources out there. You just have to know what you're doing. 
Great, thank you. There's a few more, but I'll we'll be able to answer those behind the scenes. So I'm going to turn it back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, and I just noted that we're running a little over. As if you've been in any of my webinars, you know I kind of tend to do that. But uh, we did get started a little bit late, and um, uh, I we have a lot. We've covered a lot, and we still have some really important stuff to cover. And what we're going to talk about now is all about school board meetings. So if uh, you could put up slide 25, please, Julika. Twenty six. Sorry, <laughs> I'm off one. All right. So now we're going to talk about this important aspect of this project is going to school board meetings. And um, for those of you who have agreed to or plan in the future to attend school board meetings, you're about to find out what to say and how to say it from two speakers with superior qualifications to address the issue. First, you're going to hear from Sina Trigas. She is currently co-president of the Carlsbad Oceanside Vista branch of AUW and is also a member of the Fallbrook branch. She recently retired from her position as an adjunct professor of U.S. history at Palomar College. Prior to that, she taught AP history in Vista High Schools, where she was also the social science department chair, was president of the San Marcos Unified School District, president of the San Diego School Boards Association, president of the Carlsbad Library Board, and to boot served as a political consultant for candidates running for local nonpartisan races. She should run, right? We should all get her as one of our <laughs> candidates. I think she's been there, done that though. All right. And then you're going to hear from Jean Burns Slater. I said her name backwards last time. Sorry. Um, Jean is a retired public school educator also, having begun her career as a secondary teacher of English and home, economic and home economics in Riverside County before moving to San Luis Obispo, one of my neighbors, where she worked for San Luis Coastal USD for 24 years as a middle school teacher, high school teacher, assistant principal, and principal. Upon earning her doctorate in education from USC, she followed a career path that took her to Marin County as a school district associate superintendent, and then San Benito County as a district superintendent. Once retired, she moved back to San Luis County and has served in various interim administrative positions along with coaching school administrators. Jean is also a member of her local League of Women uh, Voters chapter and, has, and her presentation is a product of a project that they are doing around civil discourse at school board meetings. So again, prepare, prepare to have more thoughts provoked and with that, take it away, Sina. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, before we get into this, there's a lot of confusion out there as far as who's in charge of our public education. And unlike most nations, um, we have a constitution, a federal system that um, separated the powers. And in fact, the 10th Amendment, and I'm doing my U.S. history kind of thing right now, but powers not delegated to the U.S. by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. And so it's up to the states. And each state has its own system, public education system, and it is controlled by the state. And so the first thing that we have to look at before we look at the local boards is the actual role of the State Board of Education in California. It goes back to 1852. We place it in our state constitution in 1884. And it is the governing and policy-making body for state public education. It is responsible for adoption of statewide academic standards, for content and student performance, adoption of curriculum frameworks, and adoption of instructional materials for K through eight. It informs and guides local development and implementation of specific curricula for K-12 students and serves as the basis for the adoption of instructional materials. So they would then look at the instructional textbooks, supplemental reading, give a list of what is aligned with the curriculum, with the standards, with the framework, and then the local boards would then 
make their decision. Next slide, please. Okay, so role, role of the local school boards is instruction. According to Education Code 240, it requires governing boards of school districts to adopt instructional materials in accordance with state code. Local governing boards shall provide substantial teacher involvement, and they're usually piloting these approved by the state textbooks and supplemental material. And they promote the involvement also, not just of the teachers and their piloting, but also getting parent input and community members. According to Ed Code 60119, boards will hold an annual public hearing and adopt a resolution that each pupil has sufficient textbook and instructional materials in core subjects, and here's the key, aligned to content standards and consistent with the content and cycles of the curriculum framework adopted by the State Board of Education. Textbooks and instructional materials are reviewed and recommended by the instructional, it's called the Instructional Quality Commission, and then it is adopted by the State Board of Education. And then of course, as I mentioned, it is typically piloted by teachers at the local school district. So that is the role as far as curriculum framework. The state establishes the criteria, the content, uh, what we want to be you know, taught in the schools. And then the local districts would of course have to abide by that uh, framework. Next slide, please. Okay, well, what about, what are we looking at? There are over 5,000 board members, more than 1,000 school districts and county offices of education. 40% of our state budget supports K through 14, and that includes community college. We know the size of districts vary from 20 to 700,000 students. Board members, with a few exceptions, are elected by voters within their school district with no party label. And here's where we have a little bit of a uh, change. A few years ago, it was decided at the state level that local elections will be done within, if it's within school districts, within districts, within those districts. So in other words, a school district could have, let's say, five districts cut up and the voters elect only their member or, or selected candidate only representing their particular district within the district. That's a little complicated. The uh, California School Boards Association, and I was a member of it, and it is a wonderful organization, and I thank the person who, who mentioned it, identifies the role of board members, and this obviously is only a partial list overseeing and development of policies, but never the implementation. That is your staff, your administration. Employing the superintendent who then hires the staff, the administrative staff. Setting direction for and adopting curriculum, which is aligned with the state requirements. Establishing budget priorities, adopting the budget. And you know, as Kathy mentioned, there's a lot of skills. It is not just the one aspect we're looking at. There's we want a candidate who is can do these things. Um, responsive to the community as a whole, not to one particular group who is backing him with funds and who is, who is aligned with his philosophy. It is the whole community that, that, that the board is responsible for. Vision reflecting consensus of the entire board, superintendent, district staff, and community as to what students need to achieve their highest potential. Next slide, please. This comes from the California School Boards Association as in 2019, and I like the quote. Effective school boards are equity driven, making intentional governance decisions that combat institutional discrimination and bias, both explicit and implicit, and eliminate disparities in educational outcomes based on socioeconomic status, gender, gender identity, gender expression, race, religion, national origin, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, or family background. This is what the California School Boards Association believes very strongly 
in and expects the board members on the local boards to follow this. Next slide, please. The framework, which was recently done, 2016 framework in history, social science. There is, it's called the FAIR Act. It incorporates new mandates such as the FAIR, accurate, inclusive, and respectful. It is across the board, K through 12. And this is the main points, completely rewritten to tell a story that reflects the contributions of many diverse groups. Strongly emphasizes student inquiry, calls on students to conduct research, guided and independent, evalu evaluate primary and secondary sources, develop arguments and make presentations. Places a strong emphasis on democratic values and the relations between the citizen and the state and encourages teachers to help their students practice the skills of engaged citizenship. All of these things that we feel very strongly about as our organization. Next, please. So now that I've kind of given you a little bit of background on this, this is when, as Kathy said, we would love to have you go to the actual board meetings and to speak. And to assist you, if you would like, we have a script. It's a general script. And again, um, use the parts that you feel comfortable with. But one of the things I want to emphasize, there's, well, actually two things. Number one, you're representing AAW. You're, I'm not representing Cena Trigas when I speak in front of the board. I have a lot more power when I say I am here speaking on behalf of AAUW, and that really has to get across, okay? The second thing is referencing co ed codes, referencing things that specifically address whatever the issue is that is being discussed that night, that specifically would say, hey, wait a minute, you're not quite following what the ed code is asking. So this script is kind of, you know, intending for you to do this. <clears throat> So the first thing in mind, oh, and also usually if it's a crowded board meeting, which it probably will be if it's a controversial issue, usually you are given two to three minutes, depending on the board, they have the right to decide on how many. I know a recent board meeting I went to, there were 70 people speaking. Can imagine, multiply that times the number of times they would be speaking and so forth. So it starts here. My name is, and I am a resident in this district, my children, grandchildren attend um, school in this district if applicable. In my case, my grandchildren attend. But today I'm speaking on behalf of the American Association of University Women, California. AUW supports academic freedom, protection of censorship and bias-free education, as well as access to curriculum that represents historically accurate information. According to the California Department of Education, in California, the State Board of Education decides on the standards for all students. I point this out to remind you that local school boards do not determine those standards. Keeping this in mind, I refer to Ed Code 51204.5, requiring social science instruction to include the role and contributions of both men and women members of various races, ethnic groups, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans, persons with disabilities, and members of other ethnic and cultural groups to the economic, political, and social development of California and the nation. Next slide, please. Continuing on with the script, local school boards do not have the right to change or distort how history or social sciences are taught in our public school. And here's then where you would insert your specific issue that you're addressing that night. Okay, and so you may want to write it down, however you feel comfortable. Then you go on. Actions taken by this board would be construed as a violation of a student's First Amendment rights, as well as California's constitutional guarantee of the right against discrimination. And now you're reminding them again who you're speaking for 
As AUW members, we believe we must have quality public education for all students. Free from hate and discrimination, we support academic freedom. We believe all students deserve a factually accurate and bias-free education. And we believe all public schools should be free from political or religious censorship. And then in bold, you're gonna say, we urge the board to vote in favor of upholding the, the, those rights by voting no, because usually it'll be a no that you want on the policy being presented tonight. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jean, who is going to talk to you on, on how you speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm on um, video. Yes, you are. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jean Burns Slater, and I'm president of Five Cities Pismo Beach AAUW on the Central Coast of California. You now know the scope and the work of AAUW California on the school boards project, and you have been introduced to the California school boards procedures. And I now have the responsibility to help you feel more comfortable when you speak out at school board meetings. Democracy requires public civil discourse. And to best facilitate this, I'm gonna offer you a few suggestions that respect differences of opinion and promote an understanding of ways to address conflict through mutually respective, courteous, and orderly communication. So let's start with some board presentation skills. What you see in front of you are some basic tips for beginners to speak at board presentations. When you're going to a school board meeting, arrive early, grab an agenda and a speaker card at the door, and then look around and find a seat where you'll be comfortable in a approaching the podium. Scan the agenda and fill out the speaker slip. Now, there's an if there's an agenda item to which you want to speak, put that agenda item number down. But you can still speak if there is not an agenda item listed. And that would be on what is called the unscheduled public appearance. So you can still speak on that as well. Turn your speaker slip into the board clerk so that your name will be called. And then when your name is called, look for that display timer, because as you know, you may have only typically three minutes to speak. And take a second to adjust the microphone to get your height, and the timer won't start until you begin speaking. So be sure and speak maybe about an inch or so from the microphone. If you're too close to it, it will cause static. Write out your remarks and your comments so that you might be feeling more comfortable and be sure and address the policy, not the person. Next slide, please. Be sincere. Speak with passion and conviction because that really does draw people's attention and watch the clock to make sure you get your main ideas covered in the allotted time. A key piece is to look at all or some of the board members. This has a great effect. Concentrate on the actual board members as they are the only ones who can make a decision that will affect the issue that you care about, not the administration, the school board members. When you're dealing with the opposition, realize that you aren't going to change their position easily, if at all. Next slide, please. Well, now we can concentrate on how you're gonna present your point of view. Use I statements. Speak from your heart. Say something about what your life experiences have been to lead you to be passionate about that issue. And you may be in a situation where your board, school board members, engage you in a dialogue. Before you express any disagreement, always start with, I hear you. I hear you, and here's what I think about it. So I have an example here. I understand that you worry about parent concerns and here's what I would suggest. This is a way to approach the school board and let them know that you are listening to them but you have an alternative way of suggesting what to do. Next slide, please. Now realize that you may not convince everyone. 
facts will not be agreed on and logic will not be consistently followed. You have to realize that. You can't always persuade the other person to change their core attitudes and beliefs. And you can't always assume that what is obvious to you is obvious to everyone else. We also have to think about speaking. We respond oftentimes without thinking when we feel anger or fear, or sometimes when we're listening to some, someone validate an existing bias. Take time to think before you respond. Next slide, please. Well, there might be some tense situations. You saw some examples in the original, the beginning of this presentation where there were police involved, 70 people were speaking. Here's some tips that can help you diffuse some tense situations. Typically, the situation, the tense piece may not be within the meeting. It may be outside the meeting and you may be confronted by someone outside of the meeting. If someone confronts you, start friendly and simply say, thanks for telling me your opinion. I appreciate listening to you. But know when and how to disagree without being disagreeable. Suggestions are that you stay focused on the topic and don't fall into a drawn out conversation. Try to avoid apologies because this weakens your position. Do not answer the baited or gotcha questions and don't return provocative statements in kind. And please avoid admonishments like, I can't believe you said that. Do you really believe that? Skip those comments. Next slide, please. Let's say that you are in a tense situation. And again, my role is to help you feel comfortable in speaking at school board meetings. If it, the situation is escalating, assess it. Most confrontations are verbal, but sometimes people involved, may there may be some potential for violence. So check your safety and the safety of everyone involved, and that should always be your first concern. Do not take anything personally what the other people are saying. Sometimes they're speaking from a very emotional position and what they're saying may not truly be what they believe. Trust your gut. If you don't feel comfortable in a situation, excuse yourself and leave. Don't be afraid to ask for outside help or support and determine whether or not you can safely deal with the person initiating the conversation. Sometimes these types of situations happen in the parking lot. If you feel that your safety or the safety of those around you is threatened, call the police. But I have been attending school board meetings and have found oftentimes there might be a security guard there for both the school board members, the audience, and the presenters. Next slide, please. If the situation continues to escalate, leave if you need to. An important part of any confrontation is trying to see if you're going to reckon that you can actually calm someone down. If you can tell the matter will not be peacefully resolved, you have the right to disengage from the conversation and leave. You have the right to always be treated with respect and you have the right to protect yourself from physical, mental, or emotional harm. And if you feel unsafe or your rights are being violated, you know it will not end well Tell the person you're feeling unsafe and you need to leave the situation. If necessary, call for help. Checklist, please. One moment while I transfer from the slides to... Well, we're getting the checklist. We have one more tool to help you prepare for attending a public school board meeting. It's an observation checklist and consider using this tool to determine the tenor of a public meeting. You might wanna to go to a school board meeting in advance of your speaking at a meeting so that you get a tenor and feeling of it. This checklist allows you to fill out your name, your organization, check and see if you have a security guard present. And it starts with the audience. The first piece, is that you have a recognizable group and notice the name of any group after the statements. Because sometimes in the audience, you will have a group of people representing 
And if you look at the checklist, it gives you some ideas of behaviors that you may see, and you could just copy out whether it's a, or decide whether it's a yes or no, or no, not applicable. And then you could go ahead and proceed listening carefully to the audience. The second portion is the board members. The board members, um, you're assessing the effectiveness of each board member. And this checklist provides you with hints to identify board members that may need to be challenged. But I also want you to realize that some effective board members on the board may be considering retiring. And the need to fill those positions with quality candidates is a key piece. And this is where we really need to work on school board recruitments. Because if there's a vacancy and we don't have a candidate, it will be filled by someone we may not feel is qualified. The next school board elections are November 2024. So we have plenty of time to get ready, start recruiting, and be comfortable in terms of who we might support in terms of school board members. The third section looks at the school board president. And this is important because we can see if this president has an ability to control the meeting and encourage respectful public and board member contributions. I've been attending school board meetings for the last couple of months on a regular basis, and I've seen very effective boards and very effective audiences, but they were well-schooled and they knew what they're doing and following their rules. By attending a board member meeting, prior to speaking publicly, you can gauge the atmosphere of the board meeting, the location of the podium, the seating arrangements, and the basic agenda format. Some boards have that unscheduled public appearance when you can speak on an, an item that's not on the agenda at the beginning of the meeting, but others put it at the very end of the meeting. You can also note by attending the school board meeting, the formality of the meeting, the presence of any security guards, if there's a welcoming attitude, and remember, you have every right to attend your local school board meetings and speak with authority. Actually, it really can be a social event and definitely a learning experience. Once you complete this checklist, as it's been suggested, you'd send it to your liaison so that they can get a sense of what's going on in your local school district and your school board. It's, it can be a very effective and positive experience being at a school board meeting. And by looking at this checklist, getting a sense of the tenor of the board meetings, and then you may feel more and more confident in speaking. So I must say that I feel very fortunate to have been able to have this section of the presentation because my section is very personable and gives you an opportunity to look at yourself and present yourself as well as the specific topic you'd like to speak on. So I want to thank you very much for participating with me on developing your presentation skills and comfort level. And um, thank you for being part of this school board project. Kathy? Thank you so much, uh, Jean, for that great presentation. And Sina, I want to thank you as well. I think that both of you have helped our our members feel more confident and comfortable in attending school board meetings and helping us out with our project. We're gonna open it up again for uh, questions. Um, and again, if you, well, at this point you can, if you have any further questions about the first part, you can ask those as well, but, but um, we really wanna make sure we get in the questions pertaining to Sina and Jean's presentation. And then I just have one final note, and that is that um, if Rhonda, could you real quickly before we do questions, could you real quickly put the um, the slides back up? Yes, one moment. Thanks. And while she's doing that, I'm going to say that um, I'm I'm going to. I've been prompted by someone that's been thought provoking to me, and uh, I'm going to. Um, reconsider my previous statement that we only want um, candidates who have an educational background. 
Um, I'm going to say go ahead and send us um, candidates that you feel would be worth looking at, uh, regardless of their background, and we'll, we can vet them and then we can make the final determination. But if you have someone that you feel strongly about and you think would be a good addition to your school district, um, go ahead and send us their name and we'll take a look at them. The thing, uh, if you could go to the next slide. And uh, the one after this, sorry. So I just wanted to point out to you all that the net, on the next five slides, we have tons and tons of uh, resources and references for you. We have the link to the survey. We have a, a I don't, I didn't get the link to the toolkit on here, but uh, I think um, somebody posted it in the chat. So you do have that now. You can find it easily in the public policy section. Here's a list of all the organizations that we've previously that we've already identified and that we have reached out to and that we're uh, hoping to, to uh, continue to work with. You can go on to the next slide. Um, here are some organizations that not don't exactly share our values. You can uh, take a look at get more information, for instance, about Moms for Liberty. And there's another organization that's come out of San Diego uh, called Reform California. And they are very, very involved. It's a Republican sponsored organization and they're very engaged in uh, giving financial support to candidates in the San Diego area. Next slide. Um, these here I've listed just, this is just some of the research that I've done and some of the articles that I've read that I think might be um, beneficial to you. You can find it's a mix. You can find out a little bit about a lot of different things. This first one, pen.org is an excellent, excellent um, organization. Be sure to go to their website and you can find out everything you need to know about book banning, what's going on and where it's taking place in the U.S. Uh, next slide. Um, this is all the resources of what's going on with California government. And I, while while Sina and Jean were talking, I had a chance to kind of do some a little bit of scanning on 1078. I couldn't find anything in the language of anything that I was reading it just in that quick period of time that helped me answer the previous question. But I'm going to keep looking at that. But there's a link here and you can go and read the bill yourself. Um, and then um, the next slide. Here's some um, here's some groups. Uh, if you want to do community organization uh, organizing within your own branch in your own area, this might help those of you who asked the previous question about what if our own branch wants to do a project like this. Here are some a couple of good resources that um, will help you with community organizing. And then finally, there's a couple of videos on here. There's a really interesting exchange between a representative from Moms for Liberty and a member of a group called Save Our Schools. It's an Arizona um, project. And they do a two-part exchange. Um, and it's very interesting. It gives you some real insight into the thinking of uh, both sides. And then there's one that we ended with just for fun. And if you want to take a look at that, um, it's very satirical. It kind of makes fun of Moms for Liberty. So we, some of us thought it was fun, but um, all right, that's it. You can uh, go ahead and uh, go back to full screen. And at this point, we'll take any additional questions that you might have. And thank you for sticking with us. I know we went over a little bit long. My two my two cohorts did a great job with their time. So I'll take all the blame for it. So, so, um, <laughs> so go ahead, ask away. <laughs> Okay, just specifically on the last segment, as you had asked, Kathy, um, regarding the how to assess the uh, school board meeting itself, a gene section, a couple of points. Someone did point out that the some of the school board elections are earlier than November of 2024, so just FYI. Uh, but they also, someone has asked, uh, you're asking them to assess whether or not the chair has followed meeting protocols, and they just wanted to know how would they know what those protocols are. Are, would that be obvious? Are you just talking about parliamentary procedure? Um, basically, I'm speaking about um, having an opportunity for people to speak at meetings. Sometimes protocols, I've seen school board members where people just start talking right from the audience. They don't have them. They're not recognized. They don't come to the podium. And the chair doesn't ask for them to do that. So it becomes a bit more chaotic as well as school board members also not being recognized when they're speaking, where they just start talking right out. 
Um, one thing I wanted to say for sure is that a board meeting is really not a public meeting. It's a school board meeting in a public setting. So it's their meeting and you are watching and attending their school board meeting. So I think that's an important point too. So you can tell if the protocols are being followed, basically oftentimes um, if, if a new school board chair, um, someone in the um, other school board will turn to them and give them some suggestions because they'll sometimes forget to call on someone or they'll ignore people. Okay, uh, thank you. And I think Jean, in the in the in the checklist, Jean has listed the four aspects of the protocol that she's that we're interested in. So they're they're right there in the body of the checklist. Mm -hmm. And a couple of people are just asking again to make sure that they understand that the presentation, the slides that you saw tonight, and the recording will both be um, posted on our website within about forty eight hours. You look under webinars, and you'll be able to find all those materials. And the toolkit includes all of these materials that you looked at tonight, the checklist and so on, the survey, which people asked about, that's also in the toolkit. So you'll see all of that. A um, little bit broader question that came in earlier. Um, will you be, well, two broader questions quickly. This is just a California project. What is AAUW National doing? Are they doing something like this too? They are not uh, doing anything of, of coming from AUW National, this has been a topic at our uh, at our our uh, monthly meetings of all of the uh, the chairs of all of the state um, uh, public policy committees. Um, it's being brought up by almost every single public policy chair, and we do discuss it quite extensively at those meetings. But uh, AUW National has not developed any special uh, any kind of a project of their own, as far as I'm aware at this point. Okay, thanks. Um... And we uh, we have some interest in whether or not uh, the team will be creating a questionnaire or survey that they could use to ask pros prospective candidates to help determine where they stand on issues. Um, we have not developed anything like that um, to date. It's something we can talk about within our subcommittee, but something that we want to develop if our members feel that it would be um useful um i'm my thinking i i guess is that if you if you've identified somebody as a potential candidate it's because you've heard them speak and you sort of know where they stand on issues otherwise you wouldn't be approaching them as a potential candidate but um that that's something we can we'll we can talk about great and maybe this gets back to gene's section that question just came in what do you recommend when Robert's rules or bylaws are not being followed, or if you believe the Brown Act has been violated? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I was a superintendent and I've worked with school boards, so I'm kind of understand that. And I think Sienna can also help with that. If it looks like, again, this is not your meeting, it's the, it's the board's meeting in public. So you can't, well, Sienna, what do you think? How would you answer that question? You know, sometimes it, it's very, um, okay, to give you an example, in, in uh, just give you an example, um, they were very careful, and they usually are very careful in understanding that you can't have the majority meeting outside, okay, in a public, and in, in talking together and so forth, um, in a, about schools. And so I think, you know, I think the boards are definitely aware of it. Do they get around it? And if they're friends and, and there's a, a situation where they meet and um, it can be, you know, unclear, are they violating it or not? Um, the example that I would give is that two of the board members on in Temecula, two of the three announced that they're holding a meeting to, to discuss school matters at their church. And they're and they're inviting people to come to their church to hear about their position on the schools, but only two are showing up. Jean, I think that that is some. It again, the Brown Act says three, but they're discussing in a public setting. Is it a violation of the Brown Act? 
I was going to make the suggestion that you speak to the superintendent. If you if you see or feel some Brown Act violations, because the superintendent is really responsible for keeping the school board on track in terms of legality. So I would suggest if you think there's some violations of the Brown Act, you go directly to the superintendent. Don't do it publicly. Just go to the superintendent and explain your concerns and ask the superintendent to help explain to you why this is being allowed. Okay, usually though that is out, it's maybe something where they met together and it's outside of the board meeting, in other words. And so some there is a, a, what, a negative to that in the, and I agree, but uh, for instance, what the board did is they fired the superintendent. That's a possibility. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, do we have anything else, uh, Don? Uh, so we have some chatter about Brown Act um, regulations, and I'll, I'll leave that to you. You can see that those chat remarks. Um, okay. The final question I think that we haven't addressed is, uh, again, a little bit about what we can legally do. Um, this question is, can we speak on behalf of AAUW to thank the school board for something that supports our values, like our local high school board just developed a land acknowledgement, which honors tribal communities, and I imagine this would build goodwill. And the, and the question is, can we, uh, can we speak on behalf of AAUW to thank a school board for something they're doing that supports our values? Sure, sure, of course, please do. Mm -hmm. I thought you might say that. Okay, I think the rest of it we've been able to manage or you have done such a thorough and comprehensive job, all of you, that there aren't as many questions as one would expect. So you must have done a great job. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you all so much. And this concludes our uh, webinar for this evening. And as you log off, please remember to complete the survey. It will pop up the minute you exit the meeting. Thank you all. And Randa, can you please stop the recording for us?